Hiya everyone, uh, I'm Nicola Winters and um, welcome to today's webinar that's all about international marketing and we'll be talking today about how to get the most out of your digital marketing campaigns. Um, so what you'll learn today um, is a little bit about sort of best practice CRO techniques um, and why they're sort of fundamental to any success, not, not just on an international scale. And then we'll take a closer look at traditional split testing or A-B testing um, that is used within conversion rate optimization to test um, and prove and disprove a hypothesis. We'll be spending a lot of time looking at sort of the cultural considerations though for international markets um, and looking at certain um, other options that brands have um, to address CRO um, and yes, get the most out of, out of your campaigns. So very briefly, for those who aren't familiar with Search Laboratory and what we do, um, we're an integrated global digital marketing agency um, of around about 150 people and we sit in offices both in the UK and in the US. So I guess what that means in practical terms is that we can support clients in all stages um, of their sort of online user journey um, by offering services such as SEO, paid media, programmatic advertising, right through to sort of social media management and digital strategy. And the unique thing about us is that we're able to do that globally um, by literally having an in-house team of multiling multilingual and native um, speaking digital marketers. So just a little bit of housekeeping for you. This webinar should last around about 30 minutes, but if you do have any questions as we go along, then do feel free to just send them through via the chat box that you can see at the side of your screen. And we'll spend a few minutes at the end and I'll just go through and answer these as well. So a little bit about me then. Um, like I say, I'm the head of international and I work from the UK office um, in Leeds and I sort of head up this department of native speaking digital marketers. And um, we are operate in around about 30 languages and service clients in 18 countries. And I remember when I first started here um, at the agency that I remember thinking that it was a really unique and unusual setup, but to be honest, the more and more we've, we've serviced the, these clients, um, I've seen that it's absolutely essential um, to be able to do it correctly, but also to be able to understand things like the cultural differences, because that would massively impact um, user behavior and, and kind of even their expectations and, and stuff um, in particular industries um, or markets. So just to, to sort of kick this off, I'm sure you're all aware, but um, CRO um, is simply about optimizing your site for, for the users. So it's all about increasing the number of, of visitors who actually convert. So a conversion could be, to be honest, anything from um, signing up to a mailing list or requesting a call back or something like that, right through to actually making a purchase. And um, traditionally how it works, we, we create multiple variations of the same page and we simply assign different users, either the control or the variant. And we, we would just gather the data to see how these changes um, have impacted the number of people converting over time. So the key thing to sort of get across though is that um, CRO actually helps every channel um, within digital market, it is especially um, a PPC, where essentially you are, you're paying for that traffic to your site anyway. And as I'm sure we'll all know, an increase in traffic doesn't necessarily mean that you'll see an, in, an increase in growth as well. Um, so with CRO, you can generate more conversions and revenue, obviously, but without increasing your ad spend. So it should be at the heart of almost every um, digital campaign because essentially this is where the action comes in. So we need to be thinking much bigger than simply landing pages and instead thinking about websites in general. So um, Carl Blanks, he is a guy from the world's leading CRO agency um, and he's been quoted as actually saying that if there was a definition for CRO, it is web design done right. Um, so as you can imagine, we, we do need to be thinking uh, much bigger than simply um, web content, if you like. And that sort of mentality of, of testing and innovating and constantly gathering data is actually at the heart of a lot of sort of 
big business um, culture and, and sort of attitude. So um, just going through a few examples here, um, Amazon have said that their success is a function of how many experiments they do per year, per month, per week and per day. Google, we're all aware that they are constantly um, running experiments, but it's part of their culture and they massively promote that. Netflix use experimentation and testing to inform as much of the business as they possibly can. And then lastly, just even booking.com. Their aim is to create the best product for their customers and they do that through constant innovation and testing. So as I've said, CRO is all about testing how changes on a page can impact the behavior of a user. So just to sort of go step by step of what that looks like, um, step one is we need to identify sort of which areas of the site aren't performing um, quite as well as, uh, as we think they should. So we would use quantitative data. Um, this is sort of taken from any CRM system, analytics, but also third party tools such as Hotjar or Crazy Egg or anything like that. Then um, we'd gather more data through customer surveys and focus groups as well to, to try and find out um, why things aren't working basically. So not just the what, but the why. And then we use these insights to essentially create a, a hypothesis such as, um, I don't know, if we, if we made the call to action clearer or in a different color, would more people convert? And then we'd create and roll out those page variants to test that very hypothesis. So <clears throat> we would just assign different users either the control um, or the variant um, to do that. The problem though when looking at this at sort of an international scale is depending on where you are in the international cycle, um, it could be that you you are yet to even launch um, a localized version of your site within that market. And even if you have, the chances are you won't be getting the high volumes of traffic that you're seeing on your parent site, whether that's um, um, somewhere in the US or in Europe. And what that means is that we can't, or businesses can't always get um, the right level of data that is required to make like a sound judgment um, on which variant is the best one going forward. Also, there can be um, quite limited presence of your brand within that market. So um, I can imagine lots of budget is being spent on things like PR and advertising, basically brand awareness campaigns. Um, and with that, of course, comes just a little bit of irrelevant traffic. And it's all about having to cut through that noise um, at a site launch. The most obvious one for international markets, though, is different languages. And um, I'm not just talking about sort of translating copy and the landing page and, and just simply talking about words. But we also need to be thinking much further than this. Are we using relevant terms and colloquialisms and things like that? Um, because that can also affect user behavior. It might just be their background, their way of life and opinions towards the world and, and things like that will definitely affect how people interact with brands online and how they behave on websites. Um, and so I wanna spend a little bit of time in this next section um, just exploring this different cultures um, part of it because um, what we can see is this might affect um, websites, not just landing pages. Um, so just focusing on um, three regions globally, if you like, they all look very, very different, but starting with um, Asia and the South Pacific. Um, so as you can see, only just over half of the population is actually online. Um, but when we look at particular countries within Asia, and I'm gonna pick on um, China um, for this example, um, a hell of a lot of revenue is taken online um, in China alone. And they, they celebrate once a year, um, sort of a tongue in cheek Valentine's Day, and um, it's called Singles Day. And that alone takes more revenue than Black Friday and Cyber Monday combined globally. So as you can see, it's extremely significant market. Then looking over at Europe, again, we have um, sort of a, a different landscape, if you like. So um, the key thing to remember with Europe is, um, whilst you might be looking at around about 50 countries and 28 languages, 
actually the, the UK, uh, France and Germany, they account for over two thirds of the total um, European e-commerce turnover. So as you can imagine, they're the three markets that, that tend um, to require the most budget. And then just lastly, in terms of um, sort of Latin America, um, recent figures um, show that there's sort of six key markets that account for around about 95% of Latin Americans turnover. Um, not surprisingly, one of those is Brazil. Um, but the others include Argentina, Chile, Colombia, um, Mexico and Peru. And I guess another thing to mention is just almost half of those e-commerce tra uh, transactions actually came from from Brazil. Um, so again, just lots of different sort of behaviours going on country to country, not just region to region. I think um, another thing to just mention is on an e-commerce website, the average conversion rate at the moment globally stands at 2.86, but that will vary massively depending on which industry you're in, um, whether it's B2B or B2C. So just to talk about the sort of cultures within um, within global marketing and things like that, we what I've done for the purposes of this webinar is um, looked at um, two society types, if you like, so collectivism and individualism. Um, so starting with collectivism, if we think um, countries like um, China um, and Japan, their collectivist society, they focus um, more on community and uh, relationships. Um, they tend to be, uh, we refer to them as high context cultures. Um, and so they respond much better, if you like, to, um, to ambiguity, um, especially if it has some sort of flair to it. Whereas individualist um, societies like the US or the UK or Germany and um, places like that, um, they're much more focused on the success of an individual. Um, and so um, we're more inclined um, to resonate with images or web content that will tell us what, how a product could make us be better or look better um, or something like that. Um, so the cultural sort of um, differences will definitely affect things like your web content, the, your page layout, colours that you use on a site and, and tone and imagery and that sort of thing. Um, so just starting off um, with sort of individualist and low context um, society, um, which is more like the Western culture, if you like. Um, this is definitely a culture that dislikes clutter. Um, they like a lot of fluidity, um, a simple design sort of website with clear, clear actions um, and images. Um, and so when we look at sort of the Samsung homepage there, it starts with a big um, sort of a banner um, across the, the home page, very short and to the point um, call to actions as well. And um, there's uh, videos within that, um, but it's all just quite a, a clean um, looking website. I'm now going to show you um, a, a website that leases cars here in the UK. Um, and actually it is extremely successful and it's been designed by um, a Chinese entrepreneur who has um, taken basically the, the theory of web design in high context cultures um, and applied it to her site. Um, you really should ring up, uh, um, read up about lingscars.com. Now apologies because that probably will hurt your eyes after a while. Um, but as I've mentioned, um, these sorts of high context cultures, they they like this rich content. It think sort of like multiple graphics and moving icons and um, animated navigation, things like that. Um, I've mentioned China, but also um, Turkey, Mexico, even those sorts of countries, they do lean a little bit towards um, more high context. Now, um, as you can see by Ling's car, I've used a very extreme example, but just to look on a, a normal e-commerce site, um, you can see on the, the laptop screen there, um, we have a snippet from uh, Debenhams, which is quite a um, successful and popular um, e-commerce site here in the UK. And when we compare that to Taobao, which is a marketplace platform based in China, you see that there are massive differences um, in the way that they have approached their, their web design. Um, so again, with Taobao, there's a lot more going on. It's a lot more fussy. Um, there are more images of the products, um, more navigation. 
Um, and now I'm going to draw on a few examples, even from big brands uh, such as like McDonald's and Coca-Cola. They've even gone as far as adapting their their websites um, and their design of their websites, uh, depending on which markets that they are targeting. So just looking at um, the McDonald's example, um, the main uh, image that you can see there on the desktop, and um, that's actually from the US version of McDonald's.com. Um, and as you can see, the sort of the center um, is just a, a huge image of the product. Um, there are videos within there, minimal text. Um, if there is text, it's usually accom um, accompanied by an adult, an adult, an image. And then uh, when we then look at the laptop, though, that is McDonald's homepage, but the Chinese version. Um, so again, there's a, a lot more options, a lot more. Um, imagery, call to actions, um, and yeah, that's even happening across one brand. So when thinking about con conducting any sort of conversion rate optimization in international markets, it massively depends, like I say, where you are in that cycle. So what I've, what I've kind of done for this webinar is put together a few sort of solutions and, and to also address some um, common cultural things that, that come up within um, CRO and um, that will hopefully overcome some of some of the barriers. So um, we'll start with um, pre-site launch. So this is when you haven't even set your site uh, live. It might be post-launch where you might have only been operating for a few weeks or months. Um, but then established is where you've been selling um, internationally for quite a while and it's it's just a case of reviewing and ongoing optimization so to start off with a uh, pre-site launch um one of the things that i'm going to talk to you about is market readiness reports um so these tend to be um carried out alongside a website translation but it, it's not um exactly a necessity to be able to do that um but essentially what it is, is it's a cultural audit. Um, it assesses the market readiness of a website against the sort of digital landscape. So it will look at things like the search engines, the, the internet users, and, and it kind of look at the market expectations and user behavior, which is really key um, for CRO. Um, these are always performed by in-market native speakers. Um, and the great thing about working alongside of any um, translation or um, copywriting sort of agency is that they actually have access to a pool of industry specialists. So these are people who will know those um, common terms and colloquialisms associated with your with your industry. And it'll look at everything um, from legal compliances right through to what a user is expecting from your website in that market. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so it's it's actually quite common when when brands launch a website um, that they will focus primarily on just the language. So they will think all about translation, localization, put the site live, and then spend a lot of that budget then in making sure um, that it's getting the right sort of visibility um, to be able to get that traffic um, and the conversion started. But one thing that a lot of people forget is that cultural compliance. Um, so this is analyzing the cultural sort of like customs and norms of your target market and ensuring that your website actually aligns with those expectations. Um, that could be your on-page content, um, but then also sort of practical aspects of your website as well. It could be anything like your payment delivery or um, returns methods, all of which can actually uh, prove to be a big sort of barrier for people um, converting, particularly if they're not um, uh, familiar um, with your brand in the first place. So a cultural audit, I'm going to go through exactly what it what it looks at. Um, but starting off with legal requirements, um, the sort of things that this will cover is um, terms and conditions, uh, any copyright or content ownership sort of policies, cookie policies and, and things like that. Um, at this point, um, you would only receive the advice that's needed, so there would be sort of re recommendations. Um, but another thing that it would it would look at, which is is really key um, for making sure that you convert 
online is it would look at the user interface and how accessible the content is so it would look at things like the readability and um, right down to the font type the font size and um, the content volume anything through to layout images colors and um, everything really um, user experience as well so there will be um, uh, an area that, that we look at that is all about navigation about you know contact or order forms and, and assessing call to actions it could even be giving um, sort of advice on any pop-ups that you've got on your site another key thing that actually is um, we, we've certainly found um, this is um, correct for Europe particularly in places like Germany but trust signals are actually um, can really drive conversion so this could be anything like reviews or um, personal data or transaction uh, protection or anything like that there's quite a lot of trust seals and certifications um, that are market specific that can really help instill a little bit of trust I guess in a new user and then um, just lastly um, going through the transaction and the checkout process so as I've mentioned payment deliveries um, payments deliveries um, returns policies and things like that so just to go through a few examples of why this is important um, and what can come out of a report like this um, we, we're all aware that copyright laws may vary from country to country um, and taking the cookie policy for example unlike EU countries where there, there is a requirement that you you need um, to have a pop-up um, explaining to users uh, how you are going uh, to sort of use their data and whatever um, in Japan it's actually not a legal requirement it's recommended um, but actually what we've found of launching new sites within Japan is that the, we can see quite a high bounce rate particularly on the home page and actually when we've remo removed the cookie policy um, it, it stayed quite level so um, that's just one example that can come out of this um, Another thing is um, terms and conditions. So in the majority of, of countries, it's actually a legal requirement that your terms and conditions must be translated for the user. Um, in other countries, not so important. Um, looking at payment and delivery methods, um, I think what's, what's really important about this um, is that the image on the screen at the moment is actually just taken from Europe alone. And as you can see, there are uh, massive sort of differences in the preferred uh, methods of payment in Europe um, and so if people can't access that method of choice um, then it's going to be a sort of a, a damaged relationship if you if you like um, also in in Japan again um, it was revealed that um, almost 74% of people would actually leave an online shop if their preferred payment method wasn't available so it can have a massive effect on um, CRO. Another few examples here. Um, so Alipay, which is used in China, actually accounts for 60% of all online spend. And so, you know, if if there's an e-commerce website and this isn't an option, imagine how many customers um, you would be alienating. Um, there's a similar sort of option um, that's used in Russia on Yandex, which is their uh, most used search engine. Um, and 65,000 sites use this option. Um, so again, depending on what industry, um, it can highlight what is expected from your customers. I wanted, I said um, a few minutes ago that I wanted to talk a bit more about trust signals and, and why particularly in Europe um, that they can be really important. Um, I guess for, for the UK or the US, as you can see um, from the percentages here, I guess we're seen as more risk takers. Um, I know myself, I don't really look out for certain um, seals or certificates or anything like that. But as you can see in, in Germany or Poland, then this is really key. And actually just through um, speaking to a lot of, of users within those markets, um, we've, we've found that actually 90% of Dutch customers are familiar with a particular trust mark um, we also do have um, a resource on the search laboratory site that has a list of all of the uh, sort of recognized seals of approval 
um, that can be used across uh, European e-commerce sites. Um, but yeah, they are they are really key. Um, I mentioned quite a lot about sort of delivery methods um, and payment methods and things like that. But um, I guess just to put that into perspective, when um, selling in Korea, um, I think what's key to remember here is that it's actually cross border selling is extremely common. So I think it's around about $90 billion of goods are imported from China alone. Um, so for them, one day or same day um, delivery, um, and to be honest, at quite a cheap price, is very normal. And so when Amazon actually tried to enter Korea a couple of years ago, they went with this USP that they were um, fast delivery. And actually, there was no real gap in the market to exploit that. Um, another thing when it comes to trust signals, 60% um, of Germans distrust online retailers because of personal data issues. So again, that's why it's really key to make sure you have the right certifications. And then I thought it was key here to um, mention Brazil. So in April, every year they have a free shipping day. And um, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because over 70% um, of people in Brazil actually said that their high shipping cost is the main reason why they're put off purchasing online. Um, so again, it's something to bear in mind um, if selling um, in Brazil. So just to kind of bring that um, cultural audit to a close, um, it's a sing single report and it determines a rating score um, looking at around about 12 areas. So we can just see a simple yes or no tick box to see how um, ready it is for that market. And wherever it isn't, there will be actions and recommendations. I just want to get across here, though, that user experience, so that's including navigation, contact forms, call to actions, anything really that is seen as a potential barrier to converting is covered as standard um, on one of the cultural audits. So moving on to post-launch now. Um, this is about sort of being able to um, gather um, data um, feedback as well from users on your site. Um, so the great thing about working with um, with sort of user testing and things is that you have sort of like two options. You can either um, have one to one sessions where you can sort of uh, run surveys or um, or you might be asking specific questions um, to people. There's also the option to just watch how people interact with your site and do that online. Um, as mentioned before, but um, working with translation and copywriters as well will give you um, access to industry specific uh, focus groups. And I'm also just going to mention just a few third party tools that you can use um, to create like heat maps um, and stuff for um, tracking behavior on the site. So the great thing about user testing, it gives you qualitative data um, from real people. As I've mentioned, you get to, to, to watch what is happening on your site as well, um, and even go back to ask these people questions to, to, to get more, more feedback. You can actually see why people are doing what they're doing. So just by the heat maps, you can see where they're, where they're looking, where they're clicking. But most importantly, what are the drop, drop off points? So just starting with user feedback, um, the great thing about this is you get to set the brief. So you can be really specific about what you're what you're looking at. Um, you could say, um, I want to, you to just focus on the form and tell me whether version A or B is better. Or it might be that you want to actually be specific and say, is this call to action better and why? And like I say, you will then um, be able to see the feedback from real users um, and make um, a decision on what to do going forward. Um, so just to summarise that one, you set a bespoke brief and task. You can build an audience based on the demographics as well. So you can start um, sort of thinking, well, what is the persona of a typical um, customer um, of my, my website? And um, pick from a pool of demographics um, within certain platforms. But also, you can recruit from your, your current customer list as well. So um, that could be good if you want to um, sort of experiment with returning customers um, and receive those commentary and any extra feedback. Um, why this is important 
um, some of the things that have come up um, with us at Search Laboratory is call to actions that are very different from, from market to market. So if we think about the US and the UK, um, we're a lot more accustomed to sort of strong and um, direct, persistent call to actions. People maybe in France or Germany, they prefer more subtle call to actions. Um, so anything that sort of indicates that you're going to provide further information maybe. Um, so the first example that I've got here actually from Hugo Boss, um, for the UK PPC ad, we've used buy now, exclamation marks, everything um, very direct sort of call to action. Whereas in the French um, advert, actually that call to action is translated to a much sort of softer order here. Um, also, um, on the screen, you've got the homepage of Amazon.com. Uh, um, all four call to actions on the homepage are shop now, um, which is, again, very direct. Whereas when we look at the Japanese version of app Amazon, it has very, very similar adverts. So the imagery is, is, is actually very similar. However, when you translate those um, call to actions, what you see happening now is the call to actions say things like, see what can be done with the Alexa series or see more at Prime Video or even Amazon Fresh 30, um, 30 free day trial or something like that. So when we're, when we're looking at call to actions for the UK or the US, we might be saying things like buy now and get 50% discount or book online now and using um, punctuation like exclamation marks to, to get that, that message across. It sounds urgent. It sounds instant. Whereas if we were going to do this in the Japanese market, we would just make really subtle changes. So 50% discount sale now on or online booking available now. And that's actually because through doing some of these user tests, we actually um, we get sort of um, qualitative data. Um, and what we found is that actually in the Japanese market, not not just online, but actually in the real world, um, it never, we never actually should be directly prompting customers to actually do anything because the saying is the customer is a god and therefore you can't tell god to do something those sorts of changes make a big difference and you can track that um those call to actions using sort of third party uh, tools anything like hot jar or crazy egg it will uh, provide you with a heat map of where people are clicking um where they're scrolling as well, because that that really helps to explain why something's happening, um, not just what is happening. Um, so just some benefits with that. Um, you can watch the video run throughs as well. Um, you can look cross device as well. So um, if, if something is happening on your mobile, but not on the desktop, why is that? And I've mentioned sort of the analyzing the why, but sometimes we can get so hung up on things like, nobody's clicking my call to action button. However, when you use one of these behavioral tools, you might actually find that um, very few users were scrolling below um, the fold. And so they haven't actually seen the call to action at all. So actually the problem lays at the top half of that page, not the bottom. Um, so just to summarize um, that section, again, it's a, it's a customized report, um, but I think, the, what I wanted to mention here is uh, Dan Jones, who is our um, head of conversion rate optimization here at Search Laboratory, um, strongly believes that 80% of issues can be identified um, for CRO in just five usability tests. So it's something that can't really uh, be ignored going forward. And then just lastly, um, when we have sort of an established site, we should be testing and it, it, it can be hard when you don't always have large volumes of traffic. But even if we're looking at sort of medium um, traffic levels, it's a strong um, recommendation to make sure that you are using multivariable testing. So thinking much bigger than a call to action, think about colors, think about background, imagery, that sort of thing. And focus on uh, building out um, and optimizing your whole website, focusing on the landing pages that can give you the best sort of return. But also think about sort of any seasonality because any testing that you do 
um, could be based on a paid campaign that you run every April because you know that there is an increase in traffic in that market every April and it's about comparing that data to, um, to that month. So just an example on this, um, with imagery when targeting different markets um, we need to, to um, think about what resonates with people. Um, so here is a US landing page that is taken from sort of a tech uh, B2B website um, and they had an identical landing page that was just in French and for some reason it wasn't converting um, at the same rate as the US one uh, but the, the traffic levels were very 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 similar and actually we, we changed quite a few things but surprisingly um, one thing that um, was quite key to us was when we changed the image and it might sound silly and really small um, but in France, it's just not inappropriate to, to sort of celebrate in the office. And just by changing that imagery, we, we noticed a, a sort of big increase in the amount of people that were filling in this form. So looking at landing pages, um, we take um, sort of this approach where we will think about the audience first and we will, we will try and empathize. Um, we try and think about those um, sort of barriers that they've got and then prioritize um, any testing. Um, and stuff like that. Um, and with sort of like landing page optimization, um, always work with an in-market specialist or um, a native speaker um, because it will make a massive difference. And then it's literally about access, assessing um, the results. So um, just seeing whether that challenger significantly output, outperformed uh, the control and then taking that forward um, for a digital strategy um, in the future. Um, so as I've mentioned, um, with international markets, um, think about that sort of seasonality trends or, or any sort of events that uh, tend to drive a few more sales and then use that, um, test landing pages, uh, different variants of, of landing pages at, attached to a paid campaign um, and compare that data to either last week, month or year, depending on what you're looking at. But why it's key to any campaign is the CRO is all about capitalizing on existing traffic. This isn't about spending budget to try and get more customers. It's saying the people are already here. How do we make this more successful? So really quickly, just to finish, um, just got a few examples um, and other tips really of what you can be doing to maximize your campaigns. So we work with a with a lot of clients, but this one in particular, an award-winning um, travel company actually, that um, they specialize in more tailor-made experiences rather than package holidays as such. So the website is, is lead um, generation um, rather than uh, making a, a booking online. And our CRO aims were to improve the conversion rate, an obvious one, um, but also maintain the quality of leads and reduce the overall cost um, per lead too. So through a lot of user experience and um, we, we did a lot of sort of swapping and changing with the, the form, so the inquiry page, um, and then prioritise sort of opportunities um, to I guess just reduce the friction uh, and make the new page just that little bit more intuitive. Um, and using those, those insights, developed the hypothesis, designed a challenger, um, and as you can see here the, the results speak for themselves. So we saw an increase in overall conversions, but also in the number of leads. Um, when, particularly in certain industries such as um, software as a service or any sort of tech um, industry, it can be quite common to, to assume that there's a, a global language. So just talking about um, tech in isolation, there's a lot of acronyms um, that is used. And to be honest, they are used globally. However, without using sort of um, specialists and native speakers, one uh, common fail, if you like, um, is that people um, do too much of that assuming. And actually what we found is that some of these tech acronyms um, have actually multiple meanings. And so would be bringing in irrelevant traffic, um, irrelevant customers and things like that, that can massively affect your uh, paid uh, advertising campaigns, anything across programmatic or social media as well. Um, but this is a resource on the site um, if anybody needs to download that. And lastly, 
Um, we've also got sort of an international shopping calendar. Um, and what this does is just look at the most um, popular countries um, for e-commerce and then identifies which times of the year um, is a good time to target customers. So I've mentioned things like the free shipping day in Brazil, uh, Singles Day in China, but there'll be many others and there'll also be um, drop offs. Um, so if I can think in certain markets, there might be um, Ramadan, which um, can affect conversion rates over um, a certain week. Which brings me to the end um, of today's webinar. Um, I did take just a little bit longer than a half hour, so apologies. Um, I do just have a couple of questions that I'm just going to try and quickly um, run through. Um, the first one is if you if you have multiple international campaigns running and they all could do with improving, how do you prioritize them? Uh, well to be honest it would always it would always depend. Um, I'm going to obviously give that obvious answer of it depends what industry, it depends what market. Um, but actually, depending on where you are in in a sort of international cycle, so if you don't have localized versions, uh, websites of the markets that you're targeting, um, but you are running paid campaigns maybe um, in those markets, then actually my advice would be focus on the markets that have a large concentration of English speakers. Um, Places like um, Russia, um, India searches quite a lot in English um, and the Nordics, um, they search quite a lot in English too. But make sure that you are completely happy with how you are converting on the English speaking markets before you even tackle um, a different language or, or culture. If you are already established and you've got localized um, versions of that site, I would say it, it's about um, a sort of putting together a bit of a digital strategy, having a look at maybe picking um, two or three markets that have the biggest um, opportunity for your brand in terms of revenue, in terms of competition, um, in terms of um, disposable income, that sort of thing. And then, yeah, really assessing the competition and spotting those gaps. Um, but that would require uh, more of a digital strategy, if you like. Um, <clears throat> just uh, the last question that I've got time for today um, is you've talked about entering new markets uh, do you have any advice or tools that you would suggest as to how to choose a new market um, yes there are lots and lots of tools out there uh, some better than others but my my advice here would be actually to the first place to look is on your parent site your analytics um, where are you getting visitors from at the moment? Are there any other uh, um, countries landing on your website, re regardless of the conversion rate? Um, and then explore those more in more in detail. Um, we tend to look at things like um, the search interest, the competition, the cost per click, the disposable income, um, but some SEM rush that can be a good tool to use. Um, but also Google does, does have a free um, sort of tool called Google Market Finder um, that kind of spills out based on your products and your industry and um, the top three markets that you should be, be entering. Um, that is it for today. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for listening. Um, if you do have any more questions, uh, feel free to just email um, us at Search Laboratory and I will get back to you um, individually. So thank you again.